So we're here to uh, discuss another aspect of uh, fossil fuels that uh, we haven't talked so much about yet. Um, and it's um, the other impacts that are not emissions really related, right? And uh, these questions, these broader co societal questions linked to um, fossil fuel extraction and the transitions away uh, from fossil fuel extraction. So we're going to focus on social, economic and health impacts. And we have a great panel here with us. Um, and um, we'll just go through all the presentations, keep your questions, and we'll have the discussion at the end. And we will start with Ploy Achakulvisut from the Stockholm Environment Institute. Today I'm excited to share uh, some preliminary results um, from a project I've been leading to quantify the health impacts and inequities of air pollution uh, from oil and gas production and use in the United States. Um, and you know we're a bit behind with the modeling, so these are very preliminary results, so please temper your expectations. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to also acknowledge all of my collaborators listed here, especially Khan Vora, who's a postdoctoral researcher at UCL, who's led um, most of the modeling to date uh, and the kind of results I'll be showing today. Okay, so there's really been two uh, main sources of motivation for this work. The first came from actually having worked on the production gap analysis over the past three years at SCI, um, where we track the levels of fossil fuel production being planned by governments worldwide and those consistent with achieving the Paris Agreement. Um, and this made me realize that actually from a pure technical climate perspective, there are many different fossil fuel phase down pathways that can be consistent with achieving net zero emissions. But of course, this line of thinking completely ignores, you know, all the public health and environmental harms of continued oil and gas extraction that we've been hearing over the past two days as well. Um, and, you know, doesn't kind of highlight the impacts being borne by industry workers and local frontline communities. And so it's our hope with this project that by being able to start assigning some concrete numbers to these impacts, we can help to compel the case for accelerating the phase out of fossil fuels in line with climate goals. So the second um, source of motivation really comes from my own academic um, background in air pollution and public health. Um, we know we have enough evidence now to know that exposure to air pollution essentially harms every major organ system in the body. It can cause, exacerbate um, many adverse health conditions uh, and increase the risk of premature deaths uh, in many, many regions of the world. Uh, and to date, there have been numerous studies to quantify um, what we call like the burden of disease attributable to air pollution, mainly from burning fossil fuels, so at the end use stage. Um, but so far, there's been very limited studies focusing on the production stages um, of oil and gas. And this is partly due to, at least in the US, the fact that oil and gas development sites um, have historically been situated in more remote and rural areas. But over the past two decades, advancements in um, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing technologies have really brought unconventional oil and gas developments closer to a lot more people. And it's estimated um, that about 18 million people, 5% of the US population, now live within about a mile of um, at least one active oil or gas well. And we know that um, emissions of air pollution can occur along the whole oil and gas supply chain. Uh, so this figure kind of just lays out some of the terminology I'll be using today. Um, so for, for example, from the upstream stage of production, you have well drilling, venting, and flaring processes. In the midstream, you can have leaks um, from transmission pipelines and storage tanks and gas compressor stations. And of course, oil refining into petrochemicals um, really significant uh, amounts of air pollution um, and of course uh, the end use of burning stage uh, that we know releases a lot of, of emissions. Um, so all these stages release uh, what are known as criteria air pollutants including fine particulate matter or PM 2.5 as well as nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds which are themselves harmful and will then further react in the atmosphere to create more PM 2.5 as well as ozone um, that have a slew of adverse health outcomes um, increasing the risk of lung and heart disease, fertility problems, neurological problems, um, increasing the risk of premature death. <clears throat> 
And you know, I think over the past few decades, the scientific community is really starting to quantify and understand all of the harmful health impacts um, arising not just from air pollution, but water, um, radioactive, ha hazardous waste, also non-chemical stresses like light and noise pollution from oil and gas production. Um, but the kind of research is, I think, relatively nascent and limited in terms of temporal um, and regional coverage. And we don't really yet have enough evidence to derive the statistical relationships that are needed to perform um, what's called health impact assessments in the epidemiological research um, to basically derive some of these numbers. Um, but I think that we can basically use the well-established relationships between certain pollutant and health outcomes like premature death from exposure to PM 2.5 from all sources to begin to start to assign some numbers um, to the air pollution emissions arising from oil and gas production. So our research has three overarching questions. Firstly, we want to understand how much do production activities contribute to um, local emissions of air pollution. And then next, we want to be able to quantify the burden of disease um, from three different aggregated stages of the oil and gas life cycle. So the combined upstream and midstream stages, the downstream stage, which is mainly oil refining, and obviously the end use stage. Um, and we're planning on quantifying three different pollutant health outcomes, PM 2.5 and premature death, PM 2.5 and preterm birth incidents, and asthma exacerbation from NOx. And finally, we also want to investigate whether um, the exposures to these different pollutants um, vary between different groups based on race and income in the US. Um, and so far, we've been able to conduct a pilot study uh, focused on Texas, the largest oil and gas producing state in the US, but we do plan to expand the whole analysis uh, to the contiguous US. Um, so yeah, today, um, most of my results will be focused on Texas. So looking at the first question, we see that um, oil and gas production activities um, are a significant source of methane and non-methane volatile organic compounds, leading to 65 to 90% of total anthropogenic emissions in Texas. It's also a large source of NOx. Um, for PM, the direct emissions are actually not so important in Texas. It turns out there's a lot of dust, sea salt, aerosols, and biomass burning happening in Texas. But bear in mind that um, basically the VOCs and NOx can further react in the atmosphere um, to form more PM2.5. So looking at the second question, so far we've been able to um, quantify the premature death burden attributable to PM2.5. Um, that arises all along the oil and gas life cycle. And I'm happy to go into the details of the health impacts assessments methods during the Q&A for anyone who's interested. Um, for now, I'll just say that the kind of most uh, resource intensive step of this calculation basically involves turning the emissions inventory into um, a modeled map of concentration. So we want to understand um, how much people are actually exposed in um, you know, a given grid cell. And the data and model um, allows us to kind of do this at the finest resolution of around 30 kilometers so far. Um, and this chemical transport model takes months and months to run. So it's um, quite a uh, resource intensive step. OK, so this plot shows um, the modeled PM2.5 concentrations over Texas um, from the three different stages of the life cycle that I showed. Um, so a lot of the PM2.5 does mainly come from the end use or the burning stage uh, for oil and gas. It con in total, these three stages contributes to around 8% of PM2.5 from all sources. And then when we um, look at the premature death attributable um, to this exposure, we find that around 4,000 deaths per year um, in 2017 are attributable to PM2.5 coming from oil and gas for the whole life cycle. And about 18% of this um, is specific to the upstream, midstream, and downstream product production stages um, of the oil and gas life cycle. So we've also modeled the resulting uh, nitrogen dioxide concentrations from oil and gas. And we actually see that for, for NO2, um, the production stages really contribute significantly um, to NO2 pollution. We actually see kind of the NO2 lighting up in major um, produce, producing basins like the Permian and Eagle Ford um, in Southern Texas there on the left. Um, and altogether, 
This, combined with the end use, so a lot of that is coming from cars, contributes to around 62% um, of all the NO2 pollution occurring in Texas. Uh, and the next, next step would be to quantify um, the burden of asthma exacerbation and hospitalizations resulting um, from NO2. And I just wanted to give a very quick teaser of um, a test run we did at a course model resolution for the whole of the US. So, you know, when you have production occurring in a given state, um, the resulting pollution can, you know, spread to neighboring states, neighboring countries like Mexico and Canada as well. Um, and the resulting health burden is also going to be influenced by how close people are situated to the sources of pollution. So we're seeing some potentially really interesting results for California and Pennsylvania, which are also, you know, big producing states, and especially for California, um, that's where there is a lot of um, people, residential areas in close proximity to oil and gas developments. Um, yeah, so we're, we're excited about this. And obviously, the, the final step will also be to try to examine whether there are different differentiated exposures and environmental justice implications for this. And yeah, with that, I'll just end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Floyd. Hi, and good afternoon. Um, I'm very excited to present some joint work that I've been uh, doing with Florian Egli and Tobias Schmidt from the Energy Technology and Policy Group at ETH Zurich. Um, this is uh, very practically applied work. So we've been talking a lot about the need for re and upskilling for the just transition in uh, many of today's and yesterday's sessions. And this is kind of a first attempt of creating a framework with which we can actually answer uh, re and upskilling questions at a granular level for different industries in different regions. Um, short table of contents. I'll give you a brief introduction, my research questions, spend some time on a conceptual framework, which uh, first uh, tries to classify occupations based on their emission intensity, and then uh, present three phase out scenarios by which we look at uh, different stages, let's say, of, of the green transition and then a, a framework for understanding how similar occupations are in terms of their skill uh, requirements and what that actually uh, means then for transition pathways from occupation that are at risk to, to different other uh, target occupations. The results will mainly focus on Germany, although we will uh, have some results ready for other uh, European countries as well. And I'll present some uh, findings about uh, the socio-demographic characteristics of uh, green and brown jobs, and then some work on where we simulate uh, moving the entire German coal workforce into, let's say, carbon neutral or carbon low carbon jobs, and how re and upskilling can actually enable this transition. Right, so introduction. So the background, right, is this, this policy and part also economically driven transition to carbon neutral economy in the EU. We have the European Green Deal in the US recently, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act has been passed. And what well, the rational is that we're gonna see job destruction in high emission sectors and job creation in low emission sectors, right? Um, if you look at the modeling studies and there's work from the ILO, from CDFOB, also from, from the academic literature, there's a large consensus that overall, in aggregate, there's gonna be net job creation, right? But uh, what's very particular about uh, the job destruction aspect is that it's very concentrated in certain industries and, and regions, which creates a large political backlash. Um, we've heard in many sessions about different chess transition frameworks. Uh, in, within the European Green Deal, we have the chess transition mechanism. Within that, the financing mechanism, chess transition fund of, of $40 billion. Uh, in the UK context, there's the UK North Sea transition deal. Right, and an important question to answer, and that's what I'm alluding to with, with these pictures, is uh, how transferable are the skill sets of, for instance, people working in the offshore oil and gas industry to offshore wind, be it now in the UK, or from coal miners to solar PV, or are they going to move to entirely different jobs? Uh, that's, that's one of the questions we're trying to answer here, which is question two. And the first one is actually where, in terms of regions and sectors, do at-risk workers cluster, uh, and what are the socio-demographic characteristics, or how can we target actually those people that are most in need of, uh, of policy support. 
So the first part of the conceptual framework uh, is basically an exercise where we try to, to take an existing um, inventory of occupations, the European ESCO classification, which provides a mapping between occupations and skills. It's very granular, uh, it involves around 3,000 occupations and 13,000 skills. And we use, so it's, it's kind of this buzzword uh, thing, right? What, what's a green job, what's a brown job? There are many different indicators that you can use to, to gather that question. We try to use indicators at the sectoral level, at the task level and the skill level. So sectoral level would, for instance, be the pollution intensity of, of an industry and how uh, pertinent concentration of workers in a certain occupation is within that industry. Uh, there is data on, on green tasks for the US, for instance. So imagine installing solar panels as, as being a green task and you can look at the fraction of green tasks in overall tasks and it gives you kind of this share of greenness for, at the occupation level. And there's also data on skills. We try to combine all of this quantitative data and match it with uh, expert assessments. Uh, so bringing in experts uh, on, on labor markets and, and the green transition and embedding both types of knowledge um, to then code all of these 3,000 occupations in the European context as, as either green, so uh, emission uh, reducing and situated in key green economy sectors, brown emission uh, enhancing, situated in, in high uh, emission sectors usually, and neutral occupations. And we validate this with an expert survey as well. So that's kind of part one of the conceptual framework. Uh, Another part of the conceptual framework are phase-out scenarios. So how fast, how many of these brown jobs that we coded are affected at which time? And we have basically a low-end, a mid-end, and a high-end scenario. So the low-end scenario is a cold phase-out, where we assume that all of those occupations that we coded as brown pertaining to the coal uh, mining and coal-fired power production sectors um, are at risk and need to transition into other occupations. The midpoint scenario says, well, oil and gas also needs to phase out now, in addition to coal, but we have a technological change allowing for the substitution of high fossil fuel input fuels and end of pipe solutions within a reasonable time frame. And the last kind of high end scenario says that these technological options are not going to be viable within uh, a reasonable time frame. Right. Um, and then the last part of the conceptual framework uh, answers or pertains to, alludes to this question of skills transferability. So what you see here is for all of these 3,000 occupations, you see the number of overlapping skills for all of the possible combination of, of transitions between occupations. So uh, it makes sense that along the diagonal, it's quite blue, right? Um, and, and we do see clusters along the diagonal, but we also see clusters uh, far off the diagonal. So in between very different occupation groups. Um, and that's the last piece of information that we kind of need to get to answering this question of, of occupation transition pathways and skills transferability. Right, and uh, so what you can do with this matrix then is identify occupation transition pathways that are viable. And we can also answer or try to answer the question of what effect does re and upskilling? So if we uh, add or if we have workers learning new skills, this will change, uh, the, let's say, the blueness of this matrix, right? And how does this then change, uh, translate into uh, the transition pathway question? On to the results. So these are some results for Germany based on very granular survey data, microsensor survey data from there. And one of the inequality questions that we have not really talked about in the sessions that I've attended so far is the divide along the gender dimension. So what you can see here is that in neutral job categories, primary the tertiary sector, service sector, uh, there's a very even distribution between uh, males and females. Once we move to the green sector, we see, well, it's mainly male. Um, a few more female uh, workers than in the brown sectors. So we see uh, there's a huge, uh, there's a huge uh, story there also in terms of promoting green jobs and making sure that this is equally uh, attractive for, for both men and women. Um, a second piece of information here about the educational uh, divide for neutral green and brown classification uh, occupations. So we see that there seems to be higher education requirements in green occupations in Germany. Uh, so the, the share of, of workers 
uh, with a bachelor's degree is twice the share in, in the brown sector and in the master's degree it's even three times the share. And we see, but that's also kind of also very uh, pertaining to the German education system, a large uh, share is in, is, has been trained in vocational education and training in the German Lehre. What you can see on the right, these are some results at the EU level. Um, and basically, it's a bit small, but the box plots are spanned by the share of brown jobs in each country and sector. And we rank this, the, the, the kind of different sectors by the median share. And we see the mining and quarrying sector coming out at the top, followed by manufacturing, so that kind of makes sense. But we see that there's a large spread between different European countries. I'm not going to go into the details there, but but we see there are on different trajectories towards uh, uh, in, within the green transition. The second set of results is uh, on transition options. So what you can see on this map is basically uh, the number of transition options out of brown jobs for at-risk workers in the coal phase-out scenario that um, find jobs in green or neutral jobs that are similar enough to their existing skill set. And we have workers choose among different options to move into the uh, occupation that uh, retains most of their wage with minimal uh, wage loss. The bluer, the, the easier to transition. And, and in this red part of Germany, there are very, very uh, few options. And we see that there are differences uh, depending on the industry from which workers transition out of, right? So in the mining and quarrying sector, this is much harder. So we have, uh, on average, one transition option that's viable per worker, whereas in the electricity gas supply sector, they have many more options. Um, sorry. How does this translate into earnings losses? So on this map shows uh, the aggregated change in annual earnings in the year 2019 for workers moving out of coal into other jobs. The thing in Germany is that there's a large wage premium on coal uh, mining and uh, jobs and, and large unionization rates. So the, the question of how do you provide a similar income is very important here. And again, we see that there is difference between different regions uh, pertaining to the economic structure and for different sectors as well. We now simulated, uh, did a simulation where every worker was re and upskilled with the skill that in this transition option space creates most additional pathways. And what we see is that the map gets a lot bluer. So retraining and reskilling workers in this sense uh, tripled the amount of transition pathways out of brown jobs in our simulations. And we, we see that now mining and quarrying workers have more than two transition options on average. And pertaining to earnings losses, we also see that now it's a lot less red and some parts of it are blue. So actually on aggregate in some regions, there's more money being created and more taxes being paid. And again, we see that there's differences uh, along the industry dimension. Let me close uh, with the key message that, that we think that navigating the green transition really requires a granular understanding of, of impacts. And we need to move beyond just knowing which sectors are affected by how many percent towards understanding changes at the occupation and skill levels and understanding them between different regions and sectors. Um, so we try to devise a classification of environmental impact dimension of occupations for the European uh, context. Um, we find that the sociodemographic characteristics, characteristics are largely uh, in parallel to, to research findings that are out so far. And we, we see this method of simulating transition pathways, reskilling options, merely as a tool. I'm not saying that the numbers are like spot on here. It's really just a tool to think about uh, different options. Uh, recommendations for policymakers, well, target policy support to those bottleneck regions where we have not a lot of transition pathways. Um, and what we mean by skill smart re and upskilling is, yeah, moving from industry to the skill level, no coding courses for coal miners in Appalachia. Uh, and the same goes for skill smart industry allocation. Thanks for your attention. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, check out our latest publication on this stream of work where we look into some conceptual uh, thoughts. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at this fantastic conference so far.
Uh, my name is Tim Donaghy. I am the research manager for Greenpeace USA, and I wanted to present on a report that we put out last year with some colleagues at the Gulf Coast Center for Law and Policy, which has now rebranded themselves as Taproot Earth um, and the Movement for Black Lives. And this is a report uh, we did on what we call fossil fuel racism, um, and you can find it online on our website. Um, and I just wanted to shout out some of my collaborators who helped put this together. Um, yeah, and to start off, I just wanted to like kind of dive in and say, what do we mean when we talk about fossil fuel racism? And I wanted to put this up here to say, as Ploy was saying in her excellent presentation, there's actually gonna be a lot of overlap, I think, between what you were talking about and this. Um, each stage of the life cycles of oil, gas, and coal generates toxic air and water pollution. So in addition to the greenhouse gases, and at each stage approximately, the public health hazards of this pollution disproportionately impact black, brown, indigenous, and poor communities. And this is something that seems from the literature we've reviewed to be generally true. There's of course some exceptions, but as a good rule of thumb in the context of the United States, this is sort of what's going on. And you know, for communities that live, for folks that live in these communities, they might look at this and say, yeah, no duh, you know, like this is this is pretty obvious. And I think, you know, the environmental justice movement, I really want to shout out because they have been saying this for decades and they have been really instrumental in bringing the concept of environmental justice into the conversation around climate change. Um, and the science community is we're finally catching up, which is great. Um, and so, you know, obviously environmental justice is a very broad topic. So it talks about, you know, some of the earlier fights around incinerators and toxic waste dumps. You can talk about, you know, access to nature in an environmental justice context. So fossil fuel racism is sort of a narrowing a little bit into the fossil fuel part of that um, because that gives us an overlap with climate policy. And so I kind of wanted to give, you know, a little bit of a taste of what we have in the report, but get to some of the bigger questions about what does this mean for climate policy and what are the questions we should keep in mind as we're designing climate policies. Um, so just to go through a real quick cartoon version of fossil fuel life cycles, you know, we have basically three stages extraction, uh, processing and transport, you know, thinking about oil refineries or natural gas processing, and then finally combustion where the fossil fuels get burnt. And that happens in a lot of different places. Um, and you can sort of see that this is obviously a very simplified version of it. Um, but pollution comes off, you know, from each of these stages in different ways. And so from the combustion end, we have, you know, sort of the carbon dioxide, which is, you know, obviously what's driving the climate crisis and what a lot of the focus of climate policy is on, and rightfully so. Um, but of course, you know, there's other greenhouse gases that are getting more attention, including methane, which comes from different parts of the, you know, the fossil fuel life cycle. And as Ploy was talking about, you know, we have criteria air pollutants, including, you know, fine particulate matter, uh, one of the main ones of concern and one of the ones that's best studied. Um, but there's also something that under the Clean Air Act in the US they call hazardous air pollutants. Um, and these often come from you know, extraction sites or you know, processing and transport sites. And these include uh, volatile organic uh, compounds, VOCs, but also like the BTEX um, chemicals, benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene are components of oil and gas. And so they're sort of inevitably there when you have oil and gas happening. Um, and benzene is of course a carcinogen. Um, and so there's definitely like the potential for a health hazard um, from this. Uh, and so you, our report, we kind of go stage by stage and kind of look at what the literature says, you know, so for example, as I'm gonna go skip through this really quickly because Ploy already uh, basically went through this in a lot more depth, um, but you know, the combustion in and the emissions of uh, criteria pollutants, including fine particulate matter, you know, it's associated uh, very strongly with a lot of uh, health problems um, I think the connection with premature mortality is becoming close to being fairly well established epidemiologically. Um, and you know, this is, it's a big number, you know, when you look globally, you know, 4.5 to 8.7 million premature deaths in 2018, that's sort of, you know, pandemic level um, public health problem. And in the context of the United States, it's also clear that there's disproportionate impact um, a lot of studies have looked at uh, PM 2.5 and found that black, Asian, Hispanic, or Latino, and low-income populations have an elevated burden of exposure to fine particulate matter. Um, and this, is, this pattern is sort of consistent across different sources. So you, if you're looking at coal-fired power plants, if you're looking at um, you know, exposure to large freeways with traffic pollution, um, you, you're, you're seeing basically that there's a disproportionate impact uh, among certain populations. Um, 
And in the context of the United States, you know, the Clean Air Act has been successful over the last decades, which means that overall air pollution has gone down, but the disparities have, have remained. Um, and just one statistic that I found fairly shocking was that the, the black 65 and older population, so African Americans who are elderly, has a three times higher um, PM 2.5 attributable death rate. Um, so this is sort of, you know, very concrete harms that we're seeing uh, due to, largely due to the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, I want to dip in real quickly to another part of the fossil fuel life cycle, looking at uh, petroleum refining. Um, and as we saw, you know, this is, you know, there's definitely criteria air pollutants associated with oil refineries, but often in many cases, it's different pollutants that are uh, associated with these. Um, and proximity to refineries, you know, leads to health risks, risks both from normal operations, um, but also oil refineries tend to have accidents and explosions. Um, there was a, a case in uh, the Chevron refinery in Richmond, California, about 10 years ago, had a, you know, an accident that sent about 10,000 people to the emergency room. Um, and the, some, some recent monitoring of EPA data shows that nearly half of all U.S. refineries had benzene emissions at levels that could pose long-term health threats for surrounding communities. I think, you know, the, the epidemiology around benzene emissions is not as well established as for fine particulate matter, but, you know, this is a known carcinogen that's sort of being emitted into our communities. Seems like something we should look into. Um, and there's, there's actually an interesting study of uh, kind of a controlled experiment looking at a closure of a refinery where they were actually able to measure health improvements in the community after the refinery closed down. Um, and just wanted to talk a little bit about some, some research we included in our report looking at, um, you know, the disproportionate impact of refineries. So this scatter plot over here on the left is all 120 oil refineries in the U.S. And the size of the dot is the, um, the size of the pollution, essentially of toxic uh, release inventory reported pollution. Um, so the bigger the dot, the more polluting it is. And the x-axis is how much that, imp that pollution impacts uh, people of color, minorities. And the y-axis is how much it impacts poor people. So you can see that there's a big cluster of U.S. refineries that are in the sort of upper right-hand quadrant, meaning that their, you know, their toxic pollution is disproportionately impacting both people of color and disproportionately impacting poor people. Um, and so, and looking at the industry as a whole, 56% 50, of their toxic burden is borne by minorities and 19% by poor people, whereas in the U.S., Generally, the red lines show sort of the national average, where 39% uh, of the U.S. population is minorities. So you can sort of see that each refinery is a little bit different, but in general, the industry is sort of weighted towards a disproportionate impact. And then to talk a little bit about some of the, the context for, you know, why this happens, um, for folks who are not um, from the U.S., um, one of the things that we have in our history is the history of redlining. Uh, and this is, has to do with going back to the 1930s and the New Deal, uh, the federal government guaranteed lo housing loans for, for people, uh, to, you know, basically to, sort, to support them in buying a home. Um, but for certain neighborhoods, uh, you couldn't get a loan. And this is a map of my hometown of Fresno, California. Um, and you can see that the neighborhoods that are marked red here, um, you know, it was basically impossible to get a home loan. And as a result, it sort of re reinforced housing segregation um, and you can still see, like, someone from Fresno would be able to look at this map and be like, yeah, it's the same pattern today. Basically, those same sort of demographic patterns have persisted for almost a century now. Um, and there's been a lot of really interesting studies looking at redlined areas and what, what is the environmental consequences for pollution today. Um, and so, like, generally speaking across the U.S., a, an area that used to be redlined um, has more pavement, fewer trees. It's about 2.6 degrees hotter due to the urban heat island effect, uh, 2.4 times higher rate of asthma emergencies, and nearly twice the density of oil wells. Um, so it's, it, there's sort of a you know, dynamic going on here that's sort of concentrating or keeping pollution concentrated in these neighborhoods. Um, and then I just wanted to sort of close out with a couple questions about sort of what does this mean for climate policy? And I think, you know, obviously, addressing the climate crisis in general means using less fossil fuels. So there's a huge opportunity here to reduce air pollution health risks um, and partly redress the sort of decades of environmental justice. So we should see this as like a really positive thing, you know, like doing a, doing a good job on climate policy is going to help solve this problem a little bit. 
But I want us to keep in mind some of these questions. You know, as we are doing this um, climate policy, have we maximized public health gains um, as we reduce carbon emissions? So, you know, because the, the scale of these harms is so big, you know, it, it's, it's a good idea to make sure we're really trying to squeeze every last drop we can of public health benefit out of our climate policy. Um, and have we reduced sort of long-standing pollution disparities? Or are there hot spots that remain um, even as the sort of overall pollution levels go down? I think, in my mind, I think about in the United States, there's a, a place called Cancer Alley. And I think you could imagine a situation where we stop using quite so much fossil fuels, but that area remains polluted. You know, it's sort of as we, you know, phase out a little bit, the, that remains a hot spot and the, the communities there remain suffering under sort of these public health harms. So that's something to keep in mind, you know, is, is the transition going to be equitable when it comes to these health pollution impacts? Um, and then a question for the, us as a research community, you know, we have all these really great metrics around carbon, you know, the social cost of carbon, um, many of these interesting um, studies we've heard about today around fossil fuel supply. Um, what research products are needed to better integrate these issues into policymaking. So what do we need to know about air pollution to make sure it's in the front of the, of our, the minds of our policymakers as they're making these decisions? So I'm really excited, the work you're doing, very, very cool. Um, you know, and I think as environmental justice advocates have pointed out many times, there's a lot of climate solutions that get thrown out there. And some of the ones that are kind of designed to sort of, you know, give a little bit of a lifeline to fossil fuels, let them continue on for a little bit longer, also have really potentially not great um, impacts on local air pollution. So things like carbon offsets, you know, uh, doesn't really do very much for the, the local community that might be suffering from, uh, from this sort of air pollution impact. Carbon capture for enhanced, enhanced oil recovery is another one. There's, you know, sometimes you hear hype around carbon neutral oil, um, but, you know, that oil is not gonna be asthma neutral or cancer neutral necessarily. Um, and that's something that we should try to, to keep in mind as well. Um, yeah, so, and then just putting it all together, you know, um, obviously this is a complicated, you know, policy question with lots of moving parts. So this is sort of the prescription we have at Greenpeace, you know, in fossil fuel racism, phase out fossil fuel production, ensure no worker communities left behind, enact a Green New Deal. In order to do all this, we need to protect and expand our democracy. So thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Martí Horta Martínez from the University of Barcelona. And today I'm going to present the work we've, do, we've been doing on mapping, uh, creating an atlas of which specific and particular oil reserves we need to leave and tap. Uh, this work, we've been, uh, well, we've been doing it with some colleagues from the International Institute of Social Studies and the University of Barcelona, but I want to mention that still I'm presenting uh, today, uh, both Lorenzo Pellegrini and myself ha have contributed equally to this work. Said that, uh, let me start with some figures that you all know, but I think it's important we keep in mind. So we all know that the carbon budget estimated from the very beginning of two, two, 2020 onwards for the target of 1.5 um, Celsius degrees was 440 gigatons of CO2. We are meeting 40, around 42 gigatons of CO2 per year. That's why the carbon budget could be uh, yeah, completely exhausted by the end of this decade. And well, the disparity between this carbon budget and the CO2 emissions embedded in the global fossil fuels is the reason for which we are all here. And it's because basically the emissions embedded in the, in the global fossil fuel reserves and the global fossil fuel resources are much higher than uh, the carbon budget we have. So uh, that's why we cannot explore for further uh, reserves and we cannot use all the reserves we know. Uh, we all know that. So. What we need to do now? Well, to manage the phase out of fossil fuels, a rational approach to do it would be to select, to prioritize which reserves, which resources we need to, to leave and tap in the ground. And basically, this is the work um, 
Christoph and Paul did in their, in their seminal paper uh, from 2015, and also the work Dan and James and Steve and, and Paul did in their more recent paper from, from last year, where they basically produced these maps showing us where we need to leave uh, higher portions of, of the reserves and resources untapped. All this work they've done is considering basically economic criteria and considering the cost opportunity of the different types of fossil fuel reserves, also including refining and, and transportation costs. Yeah, but basically with this, they came up with this with these figures. I'm going to talk just about oil, so I'm going to focus on this. Yeah, and for the different regions of the world, for the different continents, they gave us uh, different amounts of gigabarrels and percentages of the reserves that should be left untapped, making up to this global of the 58% of the oil that should be unburnable, similar for gas, the 59%, or the coal, the 89%. Yeah? So, um, also with this uh, seminal paper from, from just two years ago, from Steve Pai. Other criteria have been discussed on how to select, how to prioritize which reserves we need to leave on top. And basically coming from ethical considerations, for instance, historical responsibility in the accumulated emissions uh, has been suggested as another criteria to allocate these rights of extraction, but also the capability to bear the cost of the transition and the adaptation to, to it. But as we have seen in this in these previous um, uh, presentations, but also in, in many others during these two days, there are, let me see if this video works. Yeah, uh, so there are many severe social environmental impacts of, of oil extraction, but also from gas extraction and also from coal extraction, local social environmental impacts that obviously if we take them into account could generate additional sustainability benefits while we reduce the extraction of fossil fuels. By the way, this is uh, from an oil a recent oil spill in the northern Peruvian Amazon in the, in the Achuar territory. But, and actually this idea of taking these social environmental impacts into account was at the very beginning of the idea to leave the uh, of the idea to leave the oil in the soil from oil watch in the Niger Delta, but also uh, with the Yasuni IT proposal in Ecuador. So nothing new. Yeah. Well, I'm skipping this. So basically, what we were suggesting was to Yasunize the world and use this social environmental data, uh, spatial data, to identify which reserves we should to leave and tap. To do so. We have used data from the US uh, Geo Geological Survey uh, with all the different gigabarrels we have in the different sedimentary basins of the world. And we have used the data from, this is from Wells Vietal 2021, that was basically telling us that we need to leave and burn 81% of the oil resources of the world. This is 3,300 gigabarrels of oil meaning that we can burn the remaining 19%, that is uh, 780 gigabarrels of oil. So to allocate this, we have used, the first thing we did was to basically identify the top priority social environmental areas and to assess the amount of, of, of reserves and resources of oil that are there. Basically, what we did was to study how many reserves were in the biodiversity hotspots, but also since the biodiversity hotspots are circumscribed to terrestrial areas, we also use other uh, schemes to prioritize the global, yeah, to identify the global biodiversity conservation priorities. For instance, the rich centers of endemic species, both terrestrial and, and marine, or also the global system of natural protected areas. We also use other criteria. For instance, uh, we calculated the amount of, of oil that is in urban areas, considering a buffer of 10 kilometers, and also 
the, and the oil in the territories of indigenous people in voluntary isolation. Surprisingly, and this is the amount of gigabarrels we have in each of these different, so for instance, for the biodiversity hotspots, we have 142 gigabarrels of oil, or for the richness centers of endemic species, we have a total of 130 gigabarrels of oil, while in the global protected areas of the world, we have 140, yeah, exactly the same thing here, gigabarrels of oil. And here we have, for the social criteria, well, territories of indigenous people in voluntary isolation or urban areas, and then adding the different kinds of criteria, we came up with these 457 gigabarrels of oil. And that is far less than what we need to live on top. So that's why we consider these areas that actually have a total surface of more than 12 million square uh, kilometers, we consider them exclusion zones where oil should not be by no means be extracted. Yeah? And basically these are the maps. So sorry, because yeah, I, due to the time I just put uh, all the layers here, but we have the protected areas of the world in this light green, the biodiversity hotspots in this red, the, in the territories for indigenous people living in voluntary isolation, or yeah, the, the, the richness centers for endemic species. And in purple, the exclusion zones that basically are concentrated in some hotspots like the one in the Caribbean or the or the, uh, or the North American uh, coastal plains, or centers of uh, regional centers of endemic species, like in in Southeast Asia. Yeah. So basically, all these exclusion zones are concentrated in these areas. More surprisingly, and contrary to the concept of the carbon bombs, well, 60% of this oil in the exclusion areas is concentrated in just 10% of the exclusion areas. Basically in the Arabian Peninsula, in the Iranian Zagros Mountains, in Venezuela, in the Niger Delta, and in Siberia. Meaning that in the 90% of these exclusion zones, there are really, really minor quantities of oil. That for sure makes no sense to continue to extract or to explore that. So, well, what else we've done? Basically, since we need to find additional reserves to add to these 457 uh, gigabarrels of oil, we use continuous spatial data to identify those. We basically use, um, for instance, data on spatial data on rural human populations densities. So basically, considering all these health effects of, of oil extraction. We also use continuous data on the richness, not, not the richness centers, but the richness of terrestrial endemic species and of marine endemic species. And these are the results. So we have the purple areas that are the exclusion zones, and the green areas would be the additional areas for the different criteria. In this case, for the rural, taking into account the rural population, uh, the human rural population densities, or uh, the terrestrial um, endemic richness, yeah, with some extra areas added here in this as, as unburnable, or for the marine endemic species with these extra areas basically located in obviously these this biodiversity hotspots. So to finish, um, basically, we believe that the implementation of these atlas would maximize the collateral social, benefit, social environmental benefits of climate policies. While these exclusion zones only overlap with, as I said, 460 gigabarrels of oil that are insufficient to meet the climate policy targets, so the case for declaring them unburnable is very strong, as at least to our to our opinion and and basically yeah this could be used with additional or alternative uh, criteria for instance the presence of of indigenous people we haven't done 
uh, use it because yeah, they have the right to free prior and informed consent, so they have the, the right also to say yes to extraction, or also uh, considering social environmental conflicts, for instance, data from the environmental justice atlas. But anyway, we consider that these atlas could, could help a lot corporations also to minimize the risk of stranded assets, because for us, these are the re really the, the priorities for the unburnable oil reserves. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. Um, I had a question for, for Marty. By the way, I'm Steve Pye from UCL. Um, I just wondered, in terms of the, the zones that you were looking at for exclusion purposes, how many of them have licensing already happening in those zones? Just because it would potentially make it more problematic to develop that kind of concept uh, you know, in reality. Yeah, thanks. We'll just take a few at once. Um, Jimena? Hello, uh, Jimena Warner is from the Ford Foundation. Um, also a question for Marti. <laughs> um, I know that you just mentioned it really quickly about the criteria of why you weren't using, or that you could use also more uh, social environmental um, data. I'm curious to understand why you only chose indigenous people living in, in, in voluntary isolation and not all indigenous territories where they potentially would be overlapping with oil. And it'd be interesting to see also taking that former question, which indigenous areas where they um, where there are reserves and where there's already existing existing um, projects. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, Mikel. Thanks, Mikel Munoz, CI. A question on on the jobs. Um, when we talk about the quality of the jobs and the and the salaries. Uh, how much do you think that's a, a construct of the sector itself versus a construct of a modern industry versus a legacy industry? So if renewals were happening 50 years ago, would we have union jobs today? Or how does it compare to technology sector or other modern sectors? So if you could elaborate on that, uh, thank you. And then on the, on the racism, I was very intrigued by the Ontario one that was measured. And I was wondering, did they measure other things? Like, was there, um, did the price, property price go up? Was there gentrification? So is there any potential drawback for the community on improving the health conditions? So if we look for success on that, thank you. Very good question. I'm going to throw in one, two for Ploy, so we do a full round. Um, so when we open up uh, the discussion beyond um, emissions, uh, what political opportunities come up? Like what type of actors can we bring in the discussion that can help move things forward? Um, maybe we start with, um, we, we'll do one more, uh, with Felix and we'll go back. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, well, what I can say is that um, what's interesting is that um, these brown jobs that we're looking at, they're highly unionized. For the green jobs, that's not the case, right? So. Really, the let's say the mm, the coalition around providing decent jobs and and quality jobs around in, in the green uh, economy sectors are, are not there yet, and that's one uh, potential pitfall, I'd say, because uh, the earnings that workers, for instance, the coal industry are used to are just not we're not just just not able to provide them in in green economy sectors. So I think the government, in that sense, will probably have to step in uh, over some part of the way to fill in this gap. And then I think, yeah, I think there will, or there should be um, coalition building around uh, good quality, good earning uh, green jobs happening. And could you repeat the, the, the drawback that you were? Yeah, so was there any has anyone looked at once the community gets cleaned up of these impacts? Is there any gentrification or does oh. it yeah, yeah. have other impacts that they were not as a result of that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if anybody's looked at that. There are a handful of studies looking at, that do this sort of natural experiment of looking at um, what happens after you close down. That one was a refinery, but there are others that look at power plants um, and, and generally find uh, measurable health benefits. Um, and yeah, I get, it, you know, gentrification is one of those things that um, 
certainly happens in some places in the U.S., um, but not everywhere, you know. Um, and so I think it would probably depend, you know, on the geography and dem demographics of where the, the, the closure happened. So, but, and also interesting to look at what happens with jobs, you know, in the, that's, you know, what we have, uh, costs and benefits all intertangled together and the, you know, very often the, the communities that are suffering from the health arms often have workers in that community as well. So it's, you know, complicated, so, yeah. Thanks, Marty. If you want to elaborate on the criteria. <laughs> sure. So thanks for the questions. Um, so basically, the first answer is, yeah, this is an ongoing work. So we started with data with the USGS that was really available there, but it's really all data, not updated at all. And actually, we know that there are plenty of limitations. The, the, the scale is also not enough for this selection, but this was like the initial work. We're now working with the RISTED database, and then with this data, we will have, well, we, we will have the opportunity to really, yeah, focus on what's already being developed, and yeah, with much better scale to conduct the analysis, because actually what we did now was basically to split the reserves of the sedimentary basins on the pixels that we had for the other rasters of information. So. Yeah, um, and yeah, regarding the indigenous uh, people, actually, this was a, an internal discussion we, we, we had. And yeah, one option would, would have been to include it just to account for the number of, of to quantify the, the amount of, of reserves that are located in indigenous territories, just in an informative way, but yeah. We haven't done it because, yeah, we thought, yeah, if they have the right to say yes and to say no, um, let's not 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 put this as an exclusion zone, because yeah, we we are not gonna decide either that they don't don't want oil in their territories. So that's why we only included indigenous territories for people living in in isolation. Thanks, Blue. <laughs> Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, I think um, that's a really good question. And when we expand the conversation beyond greenhouse gas emissions, we have this opportunity to bring in so many actors, you know, from building the movement. We're seeing uh, recently, like the World Health Organization and 200 other health organizations endorsing the fossil fuel non-proliferation -prolifer treaty. Um, we've seen work being done by the Lancet Countdown to highlight like the health impacts of climate change. Um, all the way to the biodiversity crisis being highlighted by others. So I think there's kind of really opportunity to um, broaden the movement all the way to bringing in like the academic research communities um, and yeah, also like policymakers and stakeholders. So from a policy perspective, um, you know, the US has quite robust air pollution regulations under the Clean Air Act. Um, and so it's kind of opportunities for using other regulatory levers to um, limit fossil fuel production as well. I'm so wondering in terms of these like main concerns that you can mobilize around. Health is so close to us, right? I mean, it's uh, people's health. We always said health is the most important thing, right? So I think there is a lot of um, mobilization potential in, in that field. It's very, uh, very interesting and, and potentially a powerful work you're you're doing. Um, there were some more questions. Yeah, uh, the lady in the middle. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Bustamante with NRDC. Um, my question was also for Ploy. So sorry, I was a little slow getting it in for the first round. Um, I love I love the work that you're doing, and I'm really excited about it. I was a little surprised originally um, that for the life cycle um, impacts, you were looking within a particular geographic region, uh, you know, even if for so oil that's being extracted in Texas isn't necessarily being used in Texas, but I, I think it allows you to get data uh, and actually provide results, which is amazing. I wondered if you thought about or, or um, are interested in looking at pre-decision uh, how, tracing like where that oil goes and where the health impacts maybe a future oil production would be. Did that make sense? 
That was a rambling question, sorry. Do you mean where the oil ends up being used or? Yeah, so if, uh, for example, you're considering um, develop a new oil and gas extraction in Texas uh, and you want to consider the health impacts downstream where those might happen, um, is that something that you've considered maybe uh, building a cross geographic health uh, life cycle assessment? Or um, if so, do, what do you think about that kind of uh, an approach? Uh, Carl, I think you had a question, yeah. Yes, um, Carl Spelling from uh, Aalborg University, Denmark. I have a short question to Ploy and one to Felix. Um, Ploy, did you, um, I saw you cut off sort of at the onshore um, oil extraction. What about offshore? And also did you, um, how does this compare to other energy sources, biomass, coal, um, potentially geothermal and, and these things? Do you have any, any uh, insights on that? Um, and to Felix, um, I saw you excluded CCS uh, in, in your greenest uh, scenario as uh, the end of pipe solution. And I'm wondering because um, CCS can be applied as end of pipe solution, but also more proactively, um, not from fossil fuels, but from biomass and other sources to do green fuel production. So I wonder uh, what does this mean in terms of skill set and workforce? if you make that distinction. Thank you. Thanks, and we had a question towards the front, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a question maybe for everyone, but I don't know if, uh, but maybe Felix can address this first. It's on, again, a follow up on the jobs. Um, do you think that there are limits to wages, even if they were comparable even if the you know, legacy industry and the new renewable industries were comparable in terms of unionization, um, are there other intrinsic things about the differences in these industries that might have an upper, you know, create an upper limit on the profitability and hence also the wages in these sectors? Or maybe they could also be different governance structures that could affect the wages. So maybe not corporate, but cooperatively owned and so on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we'll take it, but it has to be very snappy and concise. <laughs> Thank you. Manal Shahab, University of Oxford. Um, question to the first speaker. I apologize, I didn't catch your name. Um, I think if I got it correctly, the majority of the emissions, was it like 86% or something, were in use uh, of the fossil fuels? So it's a little bit related to the first, uh, to the question from the lady in front of me. And my thinking was, why are, in, in you're looking at the, uh, you know, the effect of that will be really long term, not immediately sought. So I think you're looking at impacts of people with it, was it race and income, but why not look at, for example, intergenerational things like the old who would probably be the most impacted health wise, but also the babies who are really probably really relevant across all socioeconomic uh, um, aspects, because, um, you know, I, I think I think one of the reasons of um, the difficulty connecting health issues with with climate change and fossil fuel use is the effect is not immediate, right? It kind of takes a long time. So I'm just wondering why not look at these maybe most harmed groups um, uh, uh, in, in general that would be across all incomes and, and racial uh, distributions. And my second question, I think it was for Felix about um, um, similar to the CCS question, if it's a fossil fuel industry, but then they do have CCS, would that be blue or uh, not blue, brown, great neutral? What, what's What's the classification of that job? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ploy, you want to go first? <laughs> sure, okay. I think the first question was, am I considering oil being produced in one state and being burned elsewhere? And I think to some extent, we're going to capture that in the end use stage. Um, so modeling the health impacts of end use, we're not really tracing it to where that oil is produced, although that, that is like a concept from greenhouse gas emissions, right? Where we account for extraction-based emissions. Um, so yeah, that might be one component we could add, although the the main novelty of this work is really being able to quantify the health impacts from the production stages, um, which are which are much more local. 
Um, there was a question about, are we considering offshore emissions? Um, we are to the extent that the data is available from the EPA emissions inventories of uh, pollution emissions from oil and gas. Um, the effect is likely going to be small given, you know, there's not really populations living close to the offshore oil and gas drilling rigs. Um, yeah, I was, yeah, so yeah, to, to the extent that the data is available, we are including that. Um, and in terms of comparison to other sources, so from the preliminary results, we're seeing that, you know, from the full oil and gas life cycle across the US, um, the PM 2.5 attributable burden might be about 90,000. If we compare that, compare that to the coal life cycle, it's about 250,000. So, you know, coal is still like the dirtiest source in terms of the resulting air pollution. Um, but again, there's just so little evidence out there for oil and gas. And that's maybe like the next frontier as well. You know, the conversations around gas as a bridge fuel, gas lock-in. Um, so we kind of want to just, yeah, hone in on oil and gas production. Um, and then there was a final question on looking at health impacts, um, which I didn't quite understand. Uh, so we are quantifying the health impacts across all age groups from children to the elderly um, that that is accounted for. And we can, yeah, we can also look, I think, if I got your question right, maybe the um, environmental justice implications in terms of age, that's certainly, yeah, a great suggestion. Um, and I mean, air pollution effects are immediate, right? I mean, it's sort of, you have effects from short-term exposure, like even hour, hourly, daily, um, but also the long-term exposure. And, and these are immediate as compared to the longer-term impacts of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so sorry, I didn't quite understand the question, but yeah, thank you. Thanks, Felix. You can go now. Maybe I'll start with uh, the last question on fossil uh, fossil fuel power generation, let's say, and, uh, and CCS, would that then be blue neutral? Um, that's that's a very interesting question. I think it kind of alludes to this discussion of uh, what do we focus on? Do we just do we focus on the, do we have a carbon tunnel vision? I'd say in our project we have a bit of a carbon tunnel vision. We focus mainly on on CO two emissions. I think it's fair to say that this is not uh, the only way you could look at this, and that uh, including other impacts such as health would be worth worth considering. In our framework at the moment, it it would be neutral in that sense. Yeah. Um, Regarding CCS in other sectors, your question, Carl, this is something that, like, due to the, uh, that's super interesting, due to the data structure that we're using, we cannot really accommodate that. So we can only really accommodate CCS in, in fossil fuel intensive jobs. Um, I'm happy to talk about that later. It's a bit too nitty gritty, I think, to, to answer now. And uh, regarding the question on wages, I'm also not, I'm not quite sure if I, if I got this right. I mean, one, one thing that I think is very different uh, when we look at these uh, legacy industries and the green industries is which parts of the supply chains are located in uh, the countries. And what we see for green technologies, right, is that large parts of the supply chains that are generating a lot of value are not within the countries, are not within Germany. They are in China, they are in other countries. Um, so I think this is something uh, to consider if we then look at, let's say, um, operation, there will be more jobs in operation maintenance, solar panels will be installed and then the work that happens after maybe provides less full-time equivalents. Uh, these are uh, considerations I think where there will be differences. I hope that's, that's part of it. Very well. I will take my facilitation privilege to just uh, highlight a few points I thought were uh, really interesting and uh, that uh, we can maybe take away with us. The first one is um, the potential of this, the political potential of these, these approaches, right? And also the opportunity they uh, give us to go much uh, more precise in scale and provide much better uh, policy um, um, inputs into the policy process. Um, I think the visualization, visualization component is also very uh, strong in this session and also brings us back to the map that Nemonte talked about yesterday uh, and the power of uh, visual ways to, to show um, what's happening. And especially in that case, the potential to highlight uh, 
special racial gender inequalities and uh, therefore once we identify them do something about it yeah so on this i'll i'll, I'll end the session and i thank uh, our great panel and everybody for your participation and discussion <laughs>